So welcome everyone to another Transatlantic Poetry Broadcast. My name is Robert Peake, creator of the series, and tonight's evening was scheduled to be hosted by Malika Booker. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond her control, she's not able to join us tonight. And so our thoughts are with Malika. And uh, in conferring with the poets just before this broadcast, um, we decided that we'd like to dedicate this broadcast this reading to her. So, Malika, if you're tuning in to the archive afterward, this one's for you. So, this leaves me with the um, distinct honor, in fact, to hosting two, two wonderful poets that I'm delighted to be bringing to the reading series. Um, just a reminder of our format, um, each poet's going to read for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then for the remainder of the hour, we'll be taking your questions live on air. So as we go along throughout the reading, or even any time from now, um, if you have a thought or a question and you are tuned in live, this is your unique opportunity uh, to ask these two wonderful poets a question and get, a, get it answered live on air. So uh, there should be a little Q&A icon at the bottom of your video screen, or you can tweet using the hashtag TA Poetry, as in Transatlantic Poetry, uh, or post to the Google Plus page. We'll be monitoring all of those for your questions. So do, do ask away, fire at will. So our first poet tonight is Vani Kepeldale. Vani is a British, British and Trinidadian writer. Uh, she holds a Doctor of Philosophy uh, in Old Norse and Translation Theory, and is particularly interested in the boundaries between the human and the natural world, in multilingualism, memory, and the poetry of place. She was the first poet to tour with the Out of Bounds Poetry Project, which is creating new clickable digital poetry maps, diverse maps of, of poetry in Britain. And in the 2015-16 year, she's combining her travel with archival research supported by a Harper Wood studentship at St. John's College, Cambridge. She's published five full-length collections and two poetry pamphlets. Uh, the most recent, Measures of Expatriation, which came out this year from Carcanet, shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Forward Prize for Best Collection. Um, her book, Simple Complex Shapes, was, came out from Shearsman in 2015, and Utter came out with Pebble Tree in 2013. Sorry, Shearsman 2015 for Simple Complex Shapes. Anyway, it's my great pleasure to welcome Vani to read for you now. Hello, and thanks so much for inviting me this evening. I've managed to give away all the copies of my own books. So this is the Out of Bounds Anthology, and this is the Carcanet New Poetry 6 Anthology. Carcanet is the publisher of Measures of Expatriation, my most recent book, and I also write a column for PN Review, which is too big to fit on a very small camera. This is going to be a really long poem. Fire and darkness, and also no join, like. O oh, love that fire and darkness should be mixed, or to thy triumphs such strange torments fixed. John Donne, Elegy 13. A northern street, the temperature of the ungovernable, the proud hooded stride, the skill to add up stone, cold, outlasting, the wealth of the land, stone, kindness, the harsh kind, for each question, a better question, for each better question, one answer, for each good question, that'll do, not fust. I walk the hollow walk, loving more than loved, moved scarce more than moving, and also, in the south of this country, five times I have attended the celebrations that they hold in the dark of the year. Many centuries ago, there was a man whose name was Guy or Guido. He practiced a different competing version of the national religion. He tried to explode an important government site. These buildings are still in use. You can visit the place which is on the river. Some of the children who ask for money on British streets are simply trying to fund the construction of effigies of this hate figure who's burning on public and domestic pyres on the so-called 
bonfire night, 5 November, has become a popular ritual. Fireworks are let off. It is legal to purchase them for your own festivities. No join. A northern street, uphill, it branches like a Y, a peace sign, water coursing round an outcrop, like part of the net of a tree, like it branches in two. Upon the slope held between the branches stands a sooty church, now in use as a nightclub. This pale and brisk morning glances on the metal railings. Who is he? Nobody. Who is he between the fence and the lamppost? Nobody. A hat stuck on the railing, abandoned by a tidy drunk. A feeble visual joke. Nobody's head, nobody's, supports a hat drooped at that angle. It is a guy. A Guy Fawkes guy. The students left him there, lad for the burning. Unreal, it has to be unreal. Check out this guy. I have to cross the road, so I do. The ordinary looking foot is wedged between the base of the fence and the lamp post. The left arm bent at the elbow has been tucked deep into the jacket pocket, toneless. It is not a bad face. The eye is the pity of it, tender lids tightened into a crescent, as happens with mortally wounded birds, infolding, no longer able to yield, a turning inwards of the ability to light up. I put my hand into my pocket for my phone. It is not necessary. Pale and brisk as this morning, the police car slides into my peripheral vision. And also, a street in Trinidad, the soft brown ground doves have the same manners as the pedestrians. Unhurried, they trips along in front of cars. Why did the ground dove cross the road? I don't know, but it's certainly taking its time. The exception came plummeting out of the recessive sky into the backyard's concrete rain gutter. Had a neighborhood boy felled it inexpertly? Had the ecstatic efficiency of its heart thumped to a stop? It lay there, the softness, and would not, could not bestir itself. The child strewed it with yellow and scarlet to wild lantana flowers, thinking of burial accustomed to cremation, feeling a sudden fear. The parents took it all away. And when the dove was gone, another came plummeting the same way, the riddle repeated, to be moved, moving, and never to move. Love or some other force was identical in the equation. No join. We brought few friends home who were not already part of at least a two-generation family circle. We brought few friends home. This time, my brother had introduced a soft and brown and tallish young man in his early twenties, who weighed not much more than a hundred pounds. By historical pattern, not personal choice, in our secular Hindu household, this was the first Muslim friend our age. Perhaps it has changed, but non-Indo-Caribbeans used not to be aware that Ali and Mohammed are not Indian names, and in that unawareness they are linguistically wrong but more profoundly right, for our ancestors brought over a shared Indian village culture over a century before the creation of Pakistan and the Indus area made such a difference. And in that Trinidad, remote from Trinidad's Trinidad, and nonetheless most mixed and Trinidadian. A lunatic reverberation was set up by the 1947 partition. Some third-generation immigrant families briefly fought, according to the lines of what had not been a division. In lands far away, current events were indirectly regenerating or inventing 
this part of Trinidad's past also. By 1990, we knew that there must be some difference. We sat on the nice imported sofa with the delicate novel unicorn visitant who looked just like us. All over the island, every evening, just before seven, telephone calls were wound down, fires turned low beneath pots, and families converged on the television set to listen to the news headlines, a link with the greater world. Nothing was expected to happen. A square, reliable face showed up. The liberation of Kuwait has begun. The look of devastation and betrayal on our guest's face was like nothing I could have imagined seeing. An outline seemed to be sitting in his place, while the person who had occupied that outline crumbled. Why? Televised missile fireworks were going off, white and purple. What had so upset him? I tried to see with his eyes. Brown-skinned people with strong features and children of adorable gravity were being killed from the air. And en masse they looked more like us than anyone else on television, local or international, in those days. My insides flipped. People who looked like they could be family were being killed from the air. We are not evolved to cope with aerial threats. To witness the spectacle of bombing is to feel guilty and due to be wiped out. For so many of our gods inhabit the heavens, and to be safe our earliest kind might have taken to the trees where only the gods could smite them. To be bombed is to be smitten by the wrath of a deity not to be located and not in our image. To ascend into heaven becomes profoundly and secretly inconceivable, for the borders of the heavens are guarded with fire. Was this what our friend was seeing? The starring roles in war in our young memories hitherto had been for people who did not look like us. Or was he seeing war upon his religion? From now on, anyway, in the world's play of representations of the living, we would look more like the killed. We would resemble, like it or not, anti-advertisements for flourishing societies, which is perhaps why people on the street in the south of England have told me that they have no money, or have offered me money, when I have said nothing, or when I was about to ask for directions, and certainly have not had a guy to burn. Our soft brown young man sat and sat until he could get himself home. No join, no join, no join, and also like, like, like. This isn't the Holy Grail. The next poem set in Trinidad, All is True, is Frayed I Frayed Calendars. Listen, the day you reached into the car compartment for the house keys and didn't find them, only jumpy beads had collected out running. And we checked and panicked, and pulling up outside our then apparent house, checked again for the keys, and there they were, easily. That unsafe stashed miracle was when some kind of physics crossed one road into another. Haven't you noticed people are different since then? Some worse, others distant and a crop of long-lost cousins glistening with the universe they know and in which we share history, insists on intending good. Old lady who talks tide line, old man who thinks spiders, is frayed I frayed calendars, a set of days on the door. A 
feel I ought to look for a cheerful one. <laughs> but I've been trying to read recent things which are not incredibly cheerful. Simple Complex Shapes, uh, I gave away my last copy of. It's got a couple of goats on the cover. It's from the excellent Shazman Press. And uh, each poem contains a kind of silence. And each poem secretly has a different person, often a poet, hidden in it. The point of these poems uh, is really to be looked at, and on the page they move, uh, or you can imagine they move. Uh, and the book isn't so much a collection as an accretion. You know, like that thing you might have done when you were a child, uh, when you hang a string into some water with salt or alum, and you wait for the water to dry up and crystals to form on the string. Simple complex shapes. Enter me in the dark, please, so only see your eyes. Only feel your scars up against my walls. Take her by the hand, by the hair. Shut your eyes and lead her to the sea for the great ceremony of presentation. The pinhead where if she's to dance, she'll enjoy horizons. These warm trees, they have intentions. Make contact with them. Please be flexible. Wash out your mouth with dirt and bark. Eyes call to find out if to call. Lips don't touch upon the touch of throats. Hands in hotter climates. Trees shed leaves, caravels, and barks. They had words. There were words between them. They had words with each other. How they wrote. First without signature, then initialed. Names that bring strangeness, that could bring about vows how they wrote to each other. And these words overwintered the words they had with each other. These words forced inwards hyacinthine air stoppers make less appear. My camera freeze, let me just unfreeze it. Some Tunnox tea cakes. I did promise show and tell. A feathery bag made by the theatre maker Jeremy Hardingham. And a little rabbit sent to me by the extraordinary Trinidadian poet and festival programmer Nicholas Lochlin. Okay, and frozen. One long poem, this time set in a double location Oxford and also the east, the northeast coast of Trinidad. Cities in step, dedicated to the wayward sisters. Talk about sleeping. You dream in black and white. I dream in fauve and phosphor. Cities where people are held for interrogation. Cities where taxi drivers and policemen systematize the criminality. Cities where the friends I can depend on meet for the first time outside and by chance, mispronouncing hello. Cities where the script is not quite Roman, crying out as currency, and so are sweets. I dream cities overwhelmingly, not people. You dream of flowers, dreaming you are a girl. Clothes shopping. You say what colour suits me, you see what colour suits me, is, I see no one enter, colour, is, try the shop three miles away, colour, is, would your friend like to sign up for the newsletter and the prize draw, colour, is, you probably aren't looking for anything expensive, colour, is, oh, sorry, I thought you were together, colour, you, aren't you with him? 
his hair disinterred from a scalp hung in basements, his skin pocked and bubbling spread under soil, his shoulders reaching down to smoosh his elbows, his hands growing in your direction. How else do we know you are here? Didn't you come with him into our sunglasses shop? Our expensive sunglasses shop? Isn't he the one wanting polarized designer lenses? Why are you behaving as if you are not with him? He came in behind you. Aren't you together? Step from there. Absolutely no change. And a good face on it. Absolutely no change. Let's go for a picnic. Absolutely no change. We have the same basket. Absolutely no change. How was your day? Did you do, have, get, like, buy, eat, drink, make up, make out, like you don't dream cities overwhelmingly? We have spread a cloth on the ground, share another cloth over our knees, pass a flask without commenting fireflies, the matchbox likeness, pulled out like a thought of thinking or of polar exploration. Scott of the Antarctic, the taste of chocolate dismissing him, death seeming more New World, more Aztec, something my company will not translate. Talk about sleeping, being happy. I dream giraffes mostly, having put one together from sand under seawater, dappled by sunlight at paddling depth, or having seen it rise up, amiable, companionable, with a friendliness seldom measured by scientists, a long-lashed, essentially solitudinous, yet occasionally leaning giraffe. Truly I wanted to build bridges, reinforced with bamboo and a castle, using the classic spade and bucket, where living shells cut or sink tiny silent circles, hissing with air. And what happened? The color of black happened, rainbow which is black happened, changed texture happened, propulsive odor happened to invade hopes of building. We were playing on the beach and found oil, and looking at the map's edge we'd often drawn in schoolroom pencil, where grown up we'd come to play. Suddenly the air filled with technologized wings, the sand spurted into wells. Though that moment it was still, we were alone, nor been told to frack off. Step from there, now dream of flowers, dream we are, both girls, not people. Girls overwhelming cities, crying out, sweetening sleep. Thank you. Switching. Thank you, Vani. Wow, that was tremendous, really tremendous. So it's now my pleasure to welcome Tahimba Jess. He's joining us from the warm and windy city of Chicago, but he is a Detroit native. And his first book of poetry, Lead Belly, won the National Poetry Series in 2004. Uh, the Library Journal and the Black Issues Book Review also called it one of the best poetry books of the year. He's a fellow of Kaveh Kanem, he's a, an, an NYU alumnus. Uh, he received literature fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, a winter fellow at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. Um, he's a veteran of the Green Mill Poetry Slam team. Uh, he's won an Illinois Arts Council Fellowship, the Chicago Sun-Times Poetry Award, a Whitting Fellowship, and he's exhibited his poetry at TEDx Nashville in 2011. His second collection is Oli. It's available now from Wave Books. He's an associate professor of English at the College of Staten Island, and it's a great pleasure to have him on the show. Tahimba? Hello. Hello. Hello? Uh, am I on? Okay, I guess I'm on. <laughs> um, it's great to be here, and, uh, and uh, thank you for that. Gorgeous reading, uh, Vani. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from uh, from this book, Oleo, which just came out in uh, just came out in April. And because it's Sunday, 
um, it occurs to me to read from the heroic crown of sonnets that are in the book, which, uh, which are about the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And uh, the Fisk Jubilee Singers were really the uh, first group to popularize the spiritual in America and also across the globe. Um, I'm, go I'm going to I'm going to share uh, real quick with you um, one of the one of the texts that I had to uh, that, that I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, to uh, um, I don't know I'm not sure if I know how to how to add on to this uh, this list here. I was going to try and share some of the uh, some of the some of the texts that I had to access in order to uh, build these poems. But what I will do is I'll just read from some of these poems uh, that are about. If, if the time, but we can we can post those afterward to the site. Okay, that, that sounds great. great that sounds great. That. Thank you. Okay, so. Fisk Jubilee Singers started Fisk University around uh, 1867, and uh, this is the first poem called the Fisk Jubilee Proclamation. And uh, the epigraph is taken from Psalm 96, and it's, uh, O sing unto the Lord a new song. O sing. Undo the world with blued song, born from newly freed throats, sprung loose from lungs once bound within bonded skin, scored from dawn to dusk with coffle and lash, every tongue unfurled as the body's flag, every breath conjured despite loss we've had. Bear witness to the birthing of our hymn from storied depths of America's sin. Soul-worn psalms, blessed in our blood through dark lessons of the past, struggling to be heard. Behold, the bold sound we found in ourselves that was hidden, cast out of the garden of freedom. It's loud and unbeaten, then soft as a newborn's face, each note bursting loose from human bondage. So surrounding each of the, each of the sonnets on the top and on the bottom, is a list of the uh, of various churches, black churches, in America, that are also part of an American tradition, uh, along with the spiritual, and that is the American tradition of arson of black churches. So, I was able to research some of the uh, names of the actual churches that were burnt to the ground throughout America's history. And the very first one is one that comes up later on in the, uh, is the very first church listed is the very last church listed, and that is Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, 1822, when it was burnt down to the ground. It was also the church of Denmark Vesey, who led a, uh, a slave revolt. Also listed are Cross Ankle Church in Palmetto, Georgia, 1899, Greenleaf Presbyterian Church in Keeling, Tennessee in 1900, Red Top Church, Hopkinsville, Kentucky, 1915, First Baptist Church, Carteret, New Jersey, 1926, uh, Fulton Street, ME Church, Chicago, Illinois, 1927, Second Baptist Church, Detroit, Michigan, 1930, Macedonia Baptist Church, Egg Harbor City, New Jersey, 1935, Mount Methodist Church, Henderson, North Carolina, 1940, Negro Methodist Church, Longville, Georgia, 1947. All burned to the ground. Another, uh, the next sonnet in the sequence is dedicated to Negro Baptist Church, Loganville, Georgia, 1947, St. James AME Church, Lake City, South Carolina, 1955, Pine Grove AME Church, Somerton, South Carolina, 1955, New Hope Baptist Church, Cleveland, Mississippi, 1957, 
uh, Hope Baptist Church in Colquitt, Georgia, 1962. High Hope Baptist Church in Dawson, Georgia, 1962. Mount Olive Ch Baptist Church, uh, Albany, Georgia, 1962. Mount Mary Baptist Church, Albany, Georgia, 1962. St. Matthew's Baptist Church, Macon, Georgia, 1962. Shady Grove Baptist Church in Albany, Georgia, in 1962. All burned to the ground. Jubilee Blues. Once burst loose from human bondage, do our songs still tow our pain like a mule? Tell me, if we done burst loose from bondage, do our songs still carry hurt like a mule? They haul thundered oceans of auction blocks homeward, pulling our lost cargo through. If this freight of psalm ship hit a rock, we're gonna do just what the old folk do. If this load of song ever strike on rock, we gonna do what we was born to do. Gonna pull a world's worth harder. Ain't gonna stop till all of heaven, heaven bleeds out of blue. Every time we split our mouths to song, we'll blood the air with hallelujah's bond. This next sonnet is dedicated to Roanoke Baptist Church in Hot Springs, Arkansas, 1963. Mount Zion Methodist Church in Neshoba, Colorado. Uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, Neshoba County, Mississippi, Mississippi, 1964. Antioch Baptist Church Blue in Blue Mountain, Mississippi, 1964. Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Philadelphia, Mississippi, 1964. Sweet Rest Church of Holiness in Brandon, Mississippi, in 1964. And Williams Chapel, Ruleville, Mississippi, 1964. Church of Holy Ghost, Clinton, Mississippi, 1964. The Craven Hill Missionary Baptist Church, Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi, 1964. Pleasant Plan Missionary Baptist, Browning, Mississippi, 1964. Jerusalem Baptist Church in Natchez, Mississippi, 1964. All burned to the ground. This sonnet is in the voice of Isaac Dickerson. We lived from 1852 to 1900. We boil the air with hallelujahs balm because each of us got a story to yell out in song. Mine starts with my lonesome crying in the dark. Pod whispered, they gonna sell me in the morning sun. By five years old, I was orphaned. By eight, it was war. I got conscripted by the Rebs. They told me Yanks weren't fit to live, that they fought for raping and pillaging niggas' skin. That free will was just a trap, a deck of cards stacked against black. Well, now I fully see what they want me to believe. It's a far sight better than those chains that held us hostage. We burned down Dixie's shack with our palace of free voice. This next sonnet is dedicated to Bethel Methodist Church in Natchez, Mississippi, 1964. Mount Zion Hill Baptist Church in McComb, Mississippi, 1964. Pleasant Plan Missionary Baptist Church in Browning, Mississippi, 1964. Jerusalem Baptist Church in Natchez, Mississippi, 1964. Bethel Methodist Church in Natchez, Mississippi, 1964. Christian Union Baptist Church in Canton, Mississippi, 1964. Rose Hill Church in McComb, Mississippi, 1964. Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Meridian, Mississippi, 1964. Mount Pleasant Church, Gluckstadt, Mississippi, 1964. St. Matthew's Baptist Church in Brandon, Mississippi, 1964. This is from the Jubilee Singer, the very first of, from uh, one of the very first troop of 19 to 20 odd year old uh, Jubilee singers that traveled the world in around 1867, Liza Walker, who lived uh, from 1857 and we don't know her death day. Ma's singing will make our slave shack a palace. In the night's soft pitch, her voice would outshine any moon. Moaning with a wanton way that broke winter's hold to warm us. Oh, yes, I can still feel her woolen hum, especially when trekking Carl's country singing Jubilee. Like how she sang when daddy's last payment brought us free. 
He'd earn cash by keeping the fleas of winter stored in summer. It turns out, nigga ice gets just as froze as whites, he declared. We rose from slave house to ice house thanks to southern heat. See, I've got daddy's cool, stilled by mama's blazing hymns. When we sing, I feel them songs getting freed up from tangled cane fields. Read another one uh, from the same heroic crown of songs dedicated to the uh, first troop of uh, Jubilee singers, Fish Jubilee singers that started to tour the world in 1867. This one is dedicated to these churches that were burnt to the ground. Sand Hills Free Will Baptist Church in Hemingwell, South Carolina, 1991. Barron River Baptist Church, Bowling Green, Kentucky, 1991. Oak Grove Church, Desha County, Arkansas, 1992. St. James Church, Desha County, Arkansas, 1992. Love Rest Baptist Church in Arkansas County, Arkansas, 1992. Also, to Tucker Baptist Church in Union, South Carolina, 1992. Spring Hill Free Will Baptist Church in Macomb, Mississippi, 1993. Rocky Point Missionary Baptist Church in Macomb, Mississippi, 1993. Camp Welfare Baptist Church in Fairfield, South Carolina, 1993. St. Stephen's Baptist Church in, so in Stevens, South Carolina, 1993. 93. And this sonnet is in the voice of Maggie Porter, who was uh, the soprano of the uh, Fisk Jubilee Singers, mate who lived from 1853 to 1942. This choir helps me brave the hard weather when I sing lead soprano. Even when the concerts are relentless, we remember ways to keep our faith alive. We get pent up in sweltered rail cars and cold hotels with drafts. But the hymns roar on, nevertheless. They blast through our throats, beating injustice and those who'd see us bent to ignorance. Like when the Ku Klux burnt down the schoolhouse where I taught one Christmas. They couldn't stand to see us rise from plantation dust. How they must have angered to see me teach again. We won't stop our music until we're through tearing down Jericho's walls with our truth. And uh, this, uh, this uh, sonnet is dedicated to Mount Hill Missionary Baptist Church in Aiken County, South Carolina, 1995. Jesus Christ, Holy Gospel. In Lawrence, South Carolina, 1995. Mount Zion Baptist Church in Bology, Alabama, 1995. Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Hillsboro, North Carolina, 1995. Johnson Bro Grove Baptist Church in Bells, Tennessee, 1995. Also dedicated to Macedonia Baptist Church in Denmark, Tennessee, 1995. Mount Calvary Baptist. Hardeman County, Tennessee, 1995. St. John's Baptist Church, Dixiana, South Carolina, 1995. Mount Zion AME Church in Greeleyville, South Carolina, 1995. Bethel AME Church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 1995. And this sonnet is in the voice of Thomas Rutling, who was a member of the first troop of Jubilee singers who lived from 1855 to 1950. 1915, I thought I'd lost faith. Couldn't pray my way through the last time I saw my mother in life. I still feel the burning lashes they threw. Here, on my arm, where they whipped to make her let go. She went crying down the road, dragged, slow, chained to a wagon, pulling her off. I still remember, I still remember how she sang that Bible, though. Sweet chariot, roll, Jordan, roll. I try sometimes to hear her voice in mine. The choir helps with that, I guess. I can just about feel her holding me still, like when we'd hide in the woods away from Master's blight. How long she did she live? I wonder.
And did she die dreaming of our flight, hands clasped into starlight? And I think I'll read uh, one more, the very last one, from that uh, heroic crown of sonnets dedicated to the first troop of Fish Jubilee singers. And this one is dedicated to these churches that were burnt to the ground in the name of racial hatred. Emmanuel Christian Fellowship in Oregon, 1996. Greater Jefferson Baptist Church in Eaton, Georgia, Eatonton, Georgia in 2000. Stubbs Chapel Baptist Church, Macon, Georgia, 2000. New Evergreen Baptist Church, Macon, Georgia, in the year of our Lord, 2000. Bethlehem AME Church in Macon, Georgia, 2000. Also dedicated to St. Philip's Baptist Church, Swains, Swainsboro, Georgia, 2000. All Faith Family Worship Center in Americus, Georgia, 2000. Robertson Grove Baptist Church, Waynesboro, Georgia, 2000. Mount Hope AME Church in Macon, Georgia, 2001. Holly Springs Baptist Church in Washington County, Georgia, in 2007. Jubilee Mission. We'll haul these hymns across every destination that's never heard the word wrong through dark skin. It's our mission to birth a brown human voice bursting into freedom up from scarred and brambled paths we stumbled long from one generation to the next without rest, with soothing found only in what we've bled from the flesh, ourselves and our song. And yet, we've mostly owned our songs more than ourselves. So we've chose to sing up heaven rather than dwell down on plantations, minstrel, shuck, and buck, our home is our voice, gathered and honed and wetted and sharpened, cutting slave days down to sermon up salvation. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Tahimba. So a number of questions have been rolling in as both of our poets have been reading. and. Um, I think first question uh, from from Andrew Philip in, up in Scotland um, is asking about the relationship between poetry and politics, and, and particularly interested. I think this is one one for you, Tahim. About um, is the choice of form a political choice, or let's broaden that out. How do how does how does form and um, political discourse relate to each other? So that's for you first. Uh you know, I think that uh, in this, in in the case of, uh, I think it could, I think everything that you, um, there's a political shading to all the choices that you make in your artistic endeavors. So, in the choice of, uh, in the choice of form, um, I, I think I just speak to myself uh, and be safe <laughs> in that respect, in that regard. Um, choosing a sonnet, choosing the sonnet. Uh, to write about the lives of uh, of uh, African Americans who have uh, dedicated themselves to um, artistry and upliftment is um, a choice to kind of is to join a tradition, a choice to join a tradition and to take that tradition and meld it to another tradition of resistance. So it's it's, it's taking it's housing one inside the other and the other inside the other. Um, and it's, and it, and also, um, in this case, in the case of uh, this, the Crown of Sonnets, uh, one thing that happened is that the very first, the very, bef I, I had elected to put the names of burned African American churches on the top and at the bottom of every sonnet. Before the uh, catastrophe, before the slaughter that happened in uh, in uh, South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, in uh, last year in June, when nine people were slain in the church, so I made that decision before that happened. And when that happened, 
I called the publishers at Wave, and I told them that we had to include the name of that church in the uh, in the list of poems, and they were like, "Of course." And then when I researched the uh, when I researched the, the that church in particular more thoroughly, I realized that it was the, it was the second time a kind of uh, uh, racial um, uh, uh, violence had visited that church and it had been burnt to the ground in 1822 because of Denmark Vesey's uh, 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 attempt at, uh, at uh, a slave revolt. And so what that did was it situated that, that particular church at the very beginning and at the very end of the crown of sonnets. And as you know, in a crown of sonnets, the very first line in a crown of sonnets becomes the very last line. And so um, it, ju it, it ended up that the, the choice the, the choice to use a crown of sonnets in order to uh, discuss the lives of these, uh, of these pivotal members of the Fisk Jubilee singers uh, ended up being, a, ended up being a, a choice that was more deeply political than I had originally intended. And uh, it also ended up being a choice that mirrored um, the flow of history. Because as they say, or as has, has been said, history um, repeats itself. Or if it doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes with itself. I think Mark Twain said something like that. So um, I, think, I think form can definitely be a political choice, and it can be uh, more political than we even intend for it to be. Thank you. Tremendous. Bunny, any um, thoughts thoughts on the relationship between politics and form? I think you may need to take yourself off and mute here. I, I muted you because you were getting a little bit of echo. Okay. If you just click on mute. There. Right, so I'm unmuted now. Okay, I, I think I'd like just to tell a very small story about why I can't really separate poetry from politics. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps not just a small story, but... Uh, say thank you to the poet Peter Gizzi who gave me a lovely phrase uh, which was that he thought he was one of those poets who was like a radio station uh, in that I've got lots of things that channel and lots of voices passing through me and lots of static and interference I pick up uh, so I I'm never going to be the person who falls in love uh, and uh, sits down in a small room with my cat uh, and writes a poem that's very very perfect like a teacup or something because that's just not how I think. So I went to a symposium in Leeds uh, on the poet John Riley, who's a really good and somewhat neglected poet. And the thing is, I read a, a collection, well, a selection of his poems and his prose in preparation. And some of his prose showed right wing sympathies uh, and uh, racialized thinking. And, I, and there was this curious moment at the end of the symposium, which was really, really good in terms of discussion up till then, when everyone pussyfooted around this question and nobody wanted to say anything. And I thought to myself, it's like the last 20 minutes, and we've been talking about other issues which are also political, like who gets on the syllabus and uh, how is poetry, poetry circulated and what happens to small publishers and all these other things. Do I say something now or not? And at that point, I decided not to. And then I was traveling back from Leeds through Doncaster. These are stations in the north of England. And I was walking up a staircase in Doncaster railway station. And a very large skinhead was walking down. And I waited for him to move aside a little bit, just like a little bit. And he didn't. So I tried to go up the staircase, and he wouldn't move. So I tried again to go up the staircase, so I didn't cringe or look afraid, and he kicked me. I thought to myself, well, you know, that, that's the gods giving you a really sharp reminder. You should have said something in that symposium, and you deserved that kick. But I also thought to myself, uh, how do I contain this world? 
I've just been sitting in a nice dress uh, with lots of nice people with uh, tea and scones uh, in a wood panelled library and we're all talking equally and they're going home and I don't know what's happened to them on their way home but this has happened to me on my way home. How do I make a narrative out of the last 10 hours? These are not two different worlds, this is one world. Wow, so they're inextricable in your experience and in your work, it sounds like. Well, anybody's experienced except yeah. some people decide not to see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Both uh, Catherine, Catherine Spark is asking about kind of the inherent meaning within music, and I think this also touches into another Andrew's questions about, um, he touched on the, the what you had said, Fanny, each poem contains a kind of silence, a topic uh, near and dear to my own heart. So how do you understand or how do you relate to kind of the, the relationship between poetry and silence? What, what is that for you? Hmm. Vani, why don't you go first and then okay. break and respond. Well, one of the things that's unusual about poetry is just the sheer, I almost want to say wastefulness of the layout, just the amount of white space on the page, which Malahame called the margins of silence, but I see as the margins of lots and lots of voices. And nonetheless, I started becoming obsessed with using the blank spaces uh, as a way of creating musicality in the reader's mind. Uh, so not that I would want them to replay some score I had scored, uh, but almost like uh, saying it's okay to take time, it's okay to breathe, uh, but also giving words space uh, to sort of ring and reverberate. Uh, so I was hoping that by giving visual space around something, people would give time to sounds and let them link up. Uh, Another poet who does this is, is Kendall Hippolyte from St. Lucia, who I, I saw perform an extraordinary poem which is scored with lots of white space across the page. When Kendall performs it, his entire body is in motion and his voice goes through many tones and you can almost hear the air start to click and whistle in the gaps. I don't know how he does it. But for me, that that's partly what it is, is, is actually not putting on a voice or creating something like a spoken tune, but just letting words themselves have different times and hearing the overtones in them as if each word's a little bell. Yeah. Wow. Tremendous. Tell me about what are your thoughts on poetry and silence, on the meaning inherent in musicality, in and all of that. Yeah, it's funny, you know, when I when I think about that, I, I think about um, I've been uh, so deeply concerned with um, those who have been silenced <laughs> and those who have been uh, erased. Uh, and uh, you say the I guess in I, when it, when you say each poem contains a kind of silence, I think um, I think that there's also the idea. Of uh, working against, uh, of working against a, a silence, a kind of historical silence, uh, or, or historical silencing, um, that uh, that also ties in with the political uh, issues or the political question that came earlier. Um, and but I, I also think I also think of uh, books like uh, Zong by Norbessi Phillips and the way she takes a historical document and rearranges it and explodes it and, and explores it so that uh, we can m better understand uh, the story of, uh, of, of people that were thrown overboard on a slave ship in order to, uh, in order to make the bottom line for a slave, for a shipping company, right? Um, when I think of, uh, and it's, it's a really fantastic book, Zong, that you should get it if you can. Um, and when I think of when I think of that, the way she uses the silences between words, and also when I, when I think of uh, when I, because I've had the opportunity to see her uh, read, and I think of the way that she uses silence between uh, in in her oration, and uh, and punctuates that. Um, 
that is part of the the musicality of her of her uh, of her structure and of her approach. So you know, that's that's what they say. <laughs> When I think of silence, I also think of like the space between the notes being more, uh, in some ways, more important or just as important as the notes themselves. You know, the ghost notes. Ghost notes, the, the overtones. Right. I think you were saying. Mm -hmm. Tremendous. Well, I'm keen to open this up. Um, I wonder if you, if either of you have a question for the other poet that you'd like to ask and and get some dialogue going. Yeah, Vani, you you you're, you had the extraordinary experience of working on on the OED, correct? The Oxford English Dictionary. I think I think your mic is muted. It isn't. I oh, think okay, it's, good, good. Yeah, it's unmuted now. Okay, yeah. good. You're 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 good. See, how, what, how did that inform? Your process. I mean, you, what what kind of revelations did you did you gain from that? That's that's really intriguing. I don't know whether I'm the best person to reflect on it, which is a funny thing to say, <laughs> because uh, it the work's very well. For a start, I don't think people are supposed to say they're working there any longer if they're writers, uh, because it sort of compromises. Uh, the the independence of the dictionary because people will then start giving them words or, or some other thing I'm not sure, but it, it, the work goes very fast. You're given time targeted batches. Uh, it's incredibly intense. Uh, it's mm. on an XML based editing program, but you also have to talk to real consultants. It could be a consultant in quilting or in dance or in architecture or in slang or in anything, because obviously all the words in the world eventually come up or more or less. And uh, then you're also looking sometimes at handwritten paper slips going years back, uh, old books, facsimiles, uh, and, and everything has to be done in order. Uh, so when you're in that, uh, it's the closest you'll ever get to actually being part uh, of an animal rather than an animal itself. Uh, you know, like being a, some tiny thing that people don't like to talk about in the spleen or something. That, <laughs> <laughs> More than what it was like. But what was really, really good uh, was uh, they're the most fun people as a group I've ever worked with. Uh, like in the break times, uh, the work is so intense they have to be silly. But it's uh -huh. a very geeky and get very geeky, very informed silliness. Uh, and so, so watching old music hall or having all sorts of bizarre cakes. But the the other thing that was really good uh, was that they looked after us. Uh, so we didn't go quite crazy or lose our eyesight or anything. Just very much, have you taken your break this hour? Have you been drinking water? Don't work late. Do you need an adjustment so you can go and look after your dog? And uh, that whole thing about don't work too late, don't overwork yourself, is the opposite to what I've experienced in academia. And as a poet, it meant I knew I could clock off sometime between 5 and 7 p.m., that I was being paid every month uh, a regular wage uh, and I would definitely be able to plan my evenings, definitely be able to plan my weekends. Uh, so I, I literally had time to stare at shadows of Budlia on the neighbor's fence uh, and then did a poem which was, uh, I mean, fairly characteristically a poem reflecting on nuclear blasts and shadows and memory. <laughs> but there you go. I, I think that was, that was the regularity and the care which was an amazing environment to create out of. Okay. Sounds like a wonderful experience. Love Do you that. have a question for us for Yes, that's really technical and kind of poetish. But first a compliment, uh, which is I, I love the way that you are excavating and witnessing and remembering real names, real dates, real places, real histories in your poems. Uh, and uh, things that can't just be written off as I feel or you feel or well that's the way you see it. Uh, this sort of incontrovertible witness uh, and built into something that has a music, it's amazing. But your, your, your reading style, your reading style, your voice is often very raspy or whispery and uh, I can hear you've got a big voice if you wanted to use it uh, but instead you're using it in a way that's quite intimate uh, and quite deliberately spoken, 
it's not singing or preaching or and yet it's musical how did you arrive at this reading style huh. uh, wow um, thanks well you know I was uh, I did slam for a couple years uh -huh. and I am a I am a a veteran of the green male poetry slam that started here in Chicago mm -hmm. um, it's the original poetry slam and I learned um, by watching a lot of people read over many many different events mm -hmm. and I also learned from uh, listening or listening to myself and the way I reacted to um, uh, the way people read and the way other people reacted to the way, the way people read and what I what I discovered is that people um, people are more receptive to being talked to instead of at mm -hmm. and when they're listening to a poem so I tried to I've tried to you know read with with the same kind of expression as that somebody would would say something as if they if, when you, like when you're talking to somebody sometimes you're loud and then sometimes you get soft and that in, that kind of intensity when you get low forces yeah. the reader or forces the listener to really listen instead uh -huh. of if you're just at one level then they, they have the opportunity to just blank out yes you know? so it, it's an, it's it's I learned I learned a lot a lot from from performance poetry and slam and uh, I try to uh, take advantage of it as much as I can, um, and it and it also um, helps me reflect when I'm writing the poem. It helps me reflect on how other people might possibly hear the poem. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great stuff. Well, thanks to you both for tremendous readings and, uh, and a wonderful, rich conversation. It's just been been an absolute pleasure. It remains with me to remind our audience that if you liked anything you heard... Time flew uh, by. Seek out their books, that's right. <laughs> Go and find these people's books, find them in live readings, um, and, enjoy, and enjoy their work. Um, I also want to mention our, our next upcoming broadcast, which is at the end of this month, so... On Wednesday, the 31st of August, um, we're going to be featuring uh, Fatima Askar and Rina Minigishi. Um, that's again going to be at 8 p.m. in the UK, 3 p.m. East Coast time, noon on the West Coast. Really looking forward to that broadcast. Really grateful to to both of our poets. Very sorry Malika couldn't join us, but I'm sure she'll be back with us on another broadcast very no soon. No doubt. Thank you both. It's been an absolute. Thank you, Robert. All right. Thank you, Vani. Thank you. Thank you both. And thanks, Malika. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks, Malika. Thanks for Me. tuning in, everyone.